Welcome to L4J. I thoroughly enjoyed our study on First and Second Peter and had been praying over the last few weeks about what we should do next or if anything because of some comments people made and my own thoughts and I believe God's direction I began to look at the minor prophets. I really wanted to get back into the Old Testament and so that kind of fit with that desire and lead and I began to look at Amos and uh, Nahum but uh, overall I kind of settled on Joel thinking that, that must be where we need to go uh, I ask for you folks uh, to be praying and the feedback that I got from Facebook was uh, very encouraging and confirming so I trust that we're looking where God wants us to look so I appreciate you joining with me, and uh, as we get started on this introduction, I'd like for us to join our hearts together and go to the Lord in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the direction you give us in our lives, and we thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you for salvation and the gift of everlasting life. I pray, Lord, that you would look down upon the needs of our nation and the world today as we are in chaos. and. Lord, brother against brother and just all kind of things going on with virus and hatred. And Lord, help your love to overcome. And we pray, Lord, just look into you because you're the only one who is truly able. And I pray, Lord, that you would meet the needs of, uh, of our nation and your needs for us. And Lord, bring us peace. And we'll praise you for it. I pray, Lord, now, thanking you for those who are joining together with me as we look into your word, and we feel you've directed us to the Minor Prophets, and we're looking at the book of Joel. I pray, Lord, that as we rely upon the Holy Spirit to teach us, that our hearts and minds would be open to what he has to say. Guide and direct us, and we'll thank you for it. Meet the needs of the people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Looking at the Minor Prophets as a whole, sometimes called the Book of Twelve, uh, the earliest prophets were Amos and, and Hosea, and they warned Israel and sometimes Judah about the danger of an invasion by the Assyrian Empire, based in the powerful city-state of Nineveh, and I'm sure you've heard about Nineveh. However, their message is not simply a prediction of coming dire straits. It's a series of epic rants against everything that Israel and Judah were doing. Wrong. And most of it was wrong. Some of the things referenced were they were breaking their agreements, they were worshiping foreign gods, and they were exploiting the poor. To drive home the point, the prophet Hosea marries an adulterous prostitute. God judges Israel by having Assyria invade. So we see that sometimes God uses an enemy who doesn't even claim to worship him to bring punishment or judgment on his own. The Assyrians give the Israelites a one-way ticket to parts unknown. And you may have heard reference to the lost tribes of Israel, and that's where they are from when the Assyrians ran them out. But God is an equal opportunity judger, and eventually Assyria got its due. Along the way, a prophet named Jonah was swallowed by a giant fish, sometimes referred to as a whale, while the far less known Nahum gets so stoked the takedown of Assyria that he can't foresee how the new empire in town Babylon will make Judah miserable for years later. You know, we can't rest on laurels of what God has done for us. We need to continue to be obedient to him and seek his forgiveness when we fail him. The minor prophets end with the fallout of Judah's return from its 70-year Babylonian exile. It's a new day until old habits kick in. The prophet Malachi throws in the towel for all the prophets and the Hebrew scriptures come to a bittersweet end 
but not before he predicts that God will someday restore Israel to their former glory as one nation. Prophet Joel has a unique place in the Bible. Joel is the son of Pethuel. Little is known about him. His name, Joel, means Jehovah is God, the one true living God. He is called by some the John the Baptist of the Old Testament. Joel's position in the book of 12, the Minor Prophets, indicates that it is an early one of the Minor Prophet books. Joel reflects Judah's enemies as the Phoenicians, the Philistines, the Egyptians, and the Edomites. These were foes of God's chosen in the earlier period of the time of the Minor Prophets. Therefore, we see that Joel was one of the early ones of these prophets. The key phrase of the book of Joel is found five times in this short book. It is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. In the first part of the book, Joel speaks about the desolation that would come on Judah. After that, God speaking through him, he tells of his deliverance of his people. The prophecy of Joel begins with a description of the plague of locusts. Let's listen to the reading of the first part of Joel Thank you again for uh, joining me in this study, and I trust that we'll uh, gain a better understanding of what God wants us to know and have and apply to our lives by and through this study. We're listening to the first five verses of Joel chapter 1 now, and then following those uh, verses being read, one of our contributing churches, East Valley Baptist Church from Dunlop, Tennessee, and they have such talented musicians, and they really praise God with their music, and they'll bless us with a song, and then after that song, we'll be back into the study of Joel, and we'll be looking at those first five verses today. Be blessed as we listen to the East Valley Baptist Church and their gifted musicians. Chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten, awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Rest that induce, earth has no 
enjoyed that singing from the East Valley Baptist Church. I appreciate uh, Brother Blake and the congregation there for their contributions to L4J. Well, we've been together now for quite some time and they remain and continue to be a blessing to us. So let's get into Joel. And we just read the first five verses. I originally thought maybe we could do 10 or 13 verses. And when I got into it, I think, well, if we do five, we'll be doing good before time runs out on us. Many of us who are aged in the present time can now reflect back on earlier times in our lives when values were much more godly. We can honestly remember that life here has never been perfect, yet many of the changes projected as improvements have resulted in ungodly compromises. Personally, I know that 10 to 15 years ago, the good old days were related a lot more than they are today or that I hear today anyway. As a child, I loved to sit near my granddaddy, particularly my Papa Johnson, and I listened to every slow word he uttered about his life and the ways things used to be. Somehow, through his relating those stories, his values were taught to us who were listening. This type of activity encouraged in the book of Joel as an important means of perpetuating the values that God has shown and taught to his people are important. Sadly today, I do not see uh, such attention given nor the attentiveness of those who might be listening uh, as it was at one time. It is an important means of perpetuating the values that God has taught us. So we need to think about that. Today, it's 
we're hard pressed to have someone, any of us, to sit down for very long to listen to much of anything. Life is just going by so fast. There are many reasons why this is true, but the results seem to be that many of those godly values that we once, once treasured are not being carried forward. Some of those old practices that uh, were just a part of a slower life, I think that we are suffering because we don't have those anymore. This book of Joel is a wake-up call to Israel and Judah and because of their sinful ways. It's also a wake-up call for us today. Not only are the younger too busy to listen, especially to drawn out slowly delivered stories older folks do not take the time to tell them what are we missing the first four verses of Joel tell us of the unprecedented serious and severe times Joel's projection of the locust plague describes the impending invasion of Judah by Babylon and also by Assyria. The locust plague was so terrible, even old-timers couldn't remember anything like it. To remind you of this plague that we've been under lately, that which, if you're listening to this later on, we're still uh, suffering from conditions associated with the coronavirus COVID-19 in Joel's presentation there were four stages of the locust plague the first was a chewing locust a chewing locust the second phase was a swarming locust the third phase was a crawling locust and the fourth phase was a consuming locust. So there's an enemy coming, and the enemy or four different enemies have four different ways upon which people are suffering or from which people are suffering. There were also four world empires that ruled over God's chosen people. So is there a parallel? I think there is. These four which could be represented by these four different types of locusts, were Babylon, Persia, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And those empires at one time or another in sequence ruled over the God's chosen people. This book came from the Lord God. The word came to Joel from the Lord God. Who was Joel to get such a word? He was the son of Pethuel. That's about all we know about him. Not much more. He was just a regular person that God chose. What did Joel hear? First, he, he heard the voice of God telling him to tell the people, Listen, people, God wants our attention. First, he says, O oh, men, listen and hear. Let's read this in verse 2. It says, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? So he was saying, Listen up, ye old folks and everybody else. We need your attention. God wants our attention. And I'm afraid we're like we described earlier. We're too busy with things and our attention span is so short that it's hard for God to get our attention. But believe me, he's able and we don't need to make it too difficult, do we? So he wanted the old men to listen, but he also wanted everybody to listen. God was about to tell them of the days in which they lived and the days in which they were going to live and the days that had been before them. In verse 3, the Bible in Joel says, Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, 
and their children another generation. God instructs us. He instructs he instructed the Israelites to tell their children about their stories, about what had happened, about the challenges that they had endured, about the victories that they had won, about the defeats they had suffered. Share these things with your children, and then your children to tell their children, and them to tell their children, continuing each generation into the future. Are we doing a very good job of that nowadays? I don't think we're doing as well as we should. And I think that's one of the reasons that the Bible is telling us that our standards are being compromised. The standards of God are. Let's look at these uh, plagues of the locusts. Swarms of locusts in the book of Joel. As, uh, as long as they are in their solitary phase, they're grasshoppers. So in looking at what he was referring to, normally just year in, year out, they were grasshoppers. But for some reason, under certain conditions, they can transform into a swarming phase. And when they start swarming with those wings, then they're called locusts. There's a reference to a canker worm. And a canker worm, the Hebrew word for it is, is yelik the licking locust, which licks up the grass of the field, probably the locust at a certain stage of its growth, just as it emerges from the caterpillar stage. This is referred to in Joel 1, 4, and we'll be getting to that shortly here. Or as some read the passage, the canker worm putteth off, in other words, develops wings and fleeth away, flies away. And then it mentions in this also, it mentions a pommel worm and a caterpillar that suddenly appears in great numbers devouring herbage is referred to as a palmer worm. So Joel is using real things to describe the kinds of invasions and the kinds of kingdoms that are going to rule over the uh, God chosen people. In verse 4, the Bible reads this, That which the pommel worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm left hath the caterpillar eaten. So you see, with one, one kingdom after the other, whatever one didn't take advantage of and devour, the next one did. And what they left as freedoms or whatever the rights might be, the next one took it away. Until after the fourth one, there was nothing left for the people. So these locusts seem to have had their names from particular or peculiar properties belonging to them, as at first was from their shearing or their cropping off the fruits and the leaves of trees. And the second was from their vast increase of them, the multitude of of uh, locusts that there were there and the multitude that they bring forth and the large numbers that they appear in and that which the locust has left hath the canker worm eaten so what was left from the locust here comes the canker worm and um, so they lick up the fruits of the earth they lick what's left and it becomes barren they, they just devour what's left and then the canker worm which comes after that they eat whatever's left and so it's an it the name for canker worm comes from wasting and consuming all that comes in its way so that's the vacuum cleaner that's the thing that goes by and takes whatever's left now these came not together but followed one after the other not one one year and another the second year and so forth but all one right behind the other the palmer worm of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Chaldeans, who coming from one climate of the world destroyed both the ten and the two tribes, all of God's chosen tribes, were destroyed, that is, by these enemies. All of the people of Israel, Judah and Israel, were destroyed. Uh, the locusts, they interpret of the Medes and the Persians, 
who having overturned the Chaldean Empire carried the Jews captive. And the canker worm were the Macedonians and all the successors of Alexander, especially King Antiochus. And uh, they, like the, like the canker worm, sat in Judea and devoured all the remains of the former kings under whom were wars of Maccabees. The caterpillar they refer to the Roman Empire, the fourth and last that opposed and oppressed the Jews and drove them out of their borders. Nor of the several kings of Assyria and Babylon who followed one another and wasted the first and ten tribes and then the other two. One by one, all of the tribes were destroyed. This prophecy may point to the several invasions of incursions of the Chaldean army into Judea under Nebuchadnezzar and his generals first when he came up against Jerusalem and made Jehoiakim tributary to him a second time when he carried Jehoiakim and his family into Babylon with a multitude of the Jews and their wealth a third time when he besieged Jerusalem and took it and Zedekiah the king and carried him captive and a fourth time when Nebuchadnezzar came and burnt the temple and the houses of Jerusalem and broke down the walls of it and cleared the land of its inhabitants and of its riches. As we read and study this part of Joel, we see the results of the sinful life that the God's people had been living and the compromises that they had made and God even uses people who don't even pretend to believe in him to judge and to try to teach his people the error of their ways. I don't know for sure, but I believe that we're not going to be spared that kind of situation. God's the same today as that he has been. And when you look around and understand and see the kinds of lives that are being acceptable found acceptable now even by those who are leaders in uh, a lot of the big denominations and uh, movements of the christian world so-called we're we're in trouble and i don't know don't pretend to claim how god's going to do it but we need to let him get our attention without suffering too much whether we will or not time will tell but judgment is certain the timing is God's there's a good part though to think because there have been times in history where God's judgment came down for instance I think back to Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot being spared and you think about the condition of the world prior to and during Noah's day And yet Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So there is hope, and the hope is in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know of people who serve Jesus. You know of people, you've probably seen lives that have been changed. And not just pretended, but real. So that's a good thing, is that there's hope in Jesus Christ. And what he's done for others in saving them he will do for you there's a song like that that's sung by ann davenport and we're going to listen to that right now before we enter into the next verse verse 5 in this prophecy of joel where we will see the present condition at during joel's time and the hope for the future in the new covenant of Jesus Christ. So let's listen to Ann sing and be blessed by the words of this song. What he's done for others, he will do for you. We tell other people about what Jesus can do for us, what God can do for us. Because what he's done for others, he can do for us. And it is no secret, which is the title of that song. The 
go into the fifth verse i just want to say a few things hopefully that will uh, help us focus on the main point of uh, this lesson in this verse and it is a spiritual teaching that we need to be looking at i know when you talk about wine there's all kind of things that come up in people's mind but in this case there's a spiritual truth that's being taught in the scriptures so bear with me but this is uh this is the basis upon which i am uh, saying what i say as we get into this particular verse new wine is unfermented straight from the vineyards and i know that that can be contradicted by a lot of folks who say if it's wine it's fermented i just want to point out a verse in Jeremiah upon which I uh, base this and also a teaching that I heard from Adrian Rogers a well-respected preacher 
Jeremiah 40, 12. Even all the Jews returned out of all places whither they were driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah into Mizpah and gathered wine and summer fruits very much. They gathered wine from the vines. And so it would be to me easy to see that that was grape juice. It was grapes and the juice from the grapes, which is new wine. Think what you want, believe what you want in regard to that, because I wanted to get this out of the way because that's not the main point in the lesson. The main point has to do with a spiritual teaching that we'll get into now. So I hope that that uh, helps so that when we talk about the unfermented wine, you won't be surprised. Thank you. Let's look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Joel describes the people as if they were drunk from drinking fermented wine. As a result, they were sad, they were weeping, they were howling, they were complaining loudly because what they were enjoying was leaving them unsatisfied. They were uh, identified with folks that were drinking alcoholic wine, fermented wine, and uh, they were thinking that they were living a good life. They were thinking they were really enjoying things, but that fermented drink left them sot, drunk, left them thinking they were happy but realizing they were sad, thinking they were happy but they were crying and howling just like a bunch of drunk people because they were enjoying what they thought was the best. It had them in such a stupor that they didn't know what best was, and they were very unsatisfied with what they have. Because they were living with values of compromise. Now, this is a spiritual teaching now, but the ferment, the fermenting process changes. It compromises the pure juice of the grapes. And as it becomes more and more fermented, it's more changing to our behavior as we consume it. And they were thinking that they were happy because they were drinking this wine but it was a wine that was compromised and continued to get more compromised as it continued to ferment and so they thinking that they were doing something that was going to make them happy and joyous they found themselves to be miserable I tell you what I see a lot of evidence of that same type situations today People are spending money on big boats and on cruises and all kind of things I could mention. None of them bad in them of themselves, but never satisfying people. There's always a void. Now, that's for people that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's what makes the difference. It's not the activity. It's the source of where our joy is based and where it comes from. we They were missing the life symbolized by the new wine. And again, this is a heavy and a very important scriptural and spiritual teaching here. The new wine is the best wine. Remember when Jesus turned the water into wine and the people at the party at the wedding feast wanted to know why they saved the best to last? Because the best wine typically was served at the beginning. Well, that was the new wine. It was not even fermented. It was not compromised. So these people were missing what symbolized by the new wine, which in the spiritual sense, the new wine represents the New Testament church, which was established by Jesus Christ, the founder. And then the, the new church was, the New Testament church was born on Pentecost and what's represented by this new wine is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit 
trying to be a Christian without being empowered and taught and led by the Holy Spirit is resembled by these people who were drunk on the old wine. And we can also look at that old wine as being the religious systems of the day. If we rely upon practices and upon teachings and upon religion, we're going to be suffering. We're not going to be fulfilled. We're going to have a void in our lives. Even though we might be doing what looked to be the right thing to do, we're going to be unfulfilled. The new wine symbolizes the Holy Spirit working through believers who have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We need to be drunk on that Spirit and be filled with the Spirit as we are empowered and led by Him to do what Christ wants us to do. It was fresh. It was from the field, as in fresh-picked wine. And there's a reference to that somewhere in the scriptures about going to the going out to the vineyard and and picking wine. So we know from that 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 was a pure wine that was strictly from the grapes, and it had not been compromised. One person or a society can serve the world or God. They cannot serve both. I think the Bible says you cannot serve mammon and God. It's either one or the other. Have we as a people been lulled to sleep over time by the canker of the influence of the world? And that is a uh, good question to be, to be uh, left with us to be thinking about. Are we living a life that is burdened down with religiosity? We're trying to do what the religion teaches. And are we trying to do it like those drunk with the old wine? Are we trying to do it in our own strength? Are we trying to be worthy to be in heaven by doing the things that the church teaches? There's nothing wrong with teaching the good things but if we're doing that without knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're missing the whole boat. We're not going to heaven. We need to know Jesus, and we need to accept him and ask him to forgive us of our sins, which he has taken upon at the cross of Calvary, and he has paid the full price for those sins and left it up to us to trust him and accept what he's done for us. How he had victory over those sins was he died for them. And he suffered the agony of what we were due to suffer. He was buried, and after three days, he came back alive. And he lives today. He walked around earth for 40 days. He talked to his disciples and others. And before he left, he told the disciples which is now, that was a forerunner of the church that was born in, on the day of Pentecost. He told us to tell the story of Jesus to everybody here and a little bit further out and then all over the world. Tell about, tell about Jesus. Tell the story of Jesus. That's our job as a church of Jesus Christ. And you know what Jesus told them? He told them to wait. He said, pray and wait. Why? Because he promised that the Holy Spirit would come and that would be the birth of the church which happened on the day of Pentecost when they were all in one accord and the Holy Spirit came and all kinds of miraculous things happened where people who were gathered from all parts of the earth around then at that time in that known area were gathered together, people from all kinds of different nationalities, nations, and they each one heard the praising of God in their own language. The Holy Spirit came, and he indwells believers. And there were many churches, many people added to the churches during those early days as the Holy Spirit had full reign and control. The people were in unity. 
in the Spirit of God. And that's when the real work of Christ is done. When we are obedient to the teachings of the Word and we are empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. I pray that as we go on through this prophecy of Joel, that we will get a vision of what each one of us is to do, what God has for each one of us to do. And it may not be viewed as anything profound, but my experience is that if it's what God wants me to do or you to do, it is profound for us because we're being obedient to the Lord. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll continue picking up with verse 5 or 6 in, uh, in our next lesson and go from there with as many verses as we can. God bless you, and thank you again for paying attention and listening. May the Lord bless you. Until next week, God bless.